We thought to have this conference just after 100 days of the Trump presidency, as this has become, I suppose, a, a somewhat traditional point of assessment uh, of a new president and administration. And as I'm sure you know, it begins with President Roosevelt when he established 100 days of a special congressional session to fight the Great Depression. Over time, it has become, well, perhaps less important as a scorecard of actions than for the leadership style that is indicated. Of course, the 100-day scorecard is something that the American media take up with enthusiasm. Scholarship is supposed to work to a much slower cycle and perhaps be less judgmental in its judgments. But the rules of commentary and analysis, like much else, are changing. While scholarship is not yet driven by 24-7 news cycles and social media, not yet, it is becoming more engaged, more interactive, and I think more responsive. At the very least, the gap between event and scholarly commentary is growing narrower. Now, not all scholars are comfortable with this scholarship of the contemporary. Some of my friends are historians and they get nosebleeds. But I think, and I think there is reason to pause, but I think there's also much to begin by intellectually applying ourselves to events and discourses that are not fully formed. It's clear from the range of topics being addressed in this conference that there's a wide-ranging, wide-reaching interest in analyzing the meanings of Trump's election far beyond the policy actions or inactions of the first 100 days, and that much of that interest is in how this election has disrupted the very grounds of such analysis. I should add that I think that another reason we're gathered today has been mentioned to me several times this morning is as a kind of psychotherapy, uh, <laughs> allowing us to have these kinds of conversations with people who really want this kind of discussion. So, with that in mind, I have a few reflections as a kind of introduction, um, which I've labeled Something Happened. Um, and I, I take that label or that title from the lyrics of an old song. I just wonder if anyone knows them. There's something happening here, and what it is isn't exactly clear. Anybody know those? Buffalo Springfield. Buffalo Springfield. I'm not the only old hippie in the room, it seems. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Bob. Um, OK, in the wake of Trump's election, there was a rush by commentators, journalists, pollsters, academics, to question what it meant and why they failed to see it coming. Many expressed a frustrating sense of failure, that something had blindsided them. They seem confounded by events and processes that they're supposed to know something about. For all these commentators, there was, I think, a sense, somewhat nebulous, that the grounds of analysis and debate had shifted. Something happened. That something exceeded existing means of explanation and representation. For the journalists, the challenge, I think, has been to understand and respond to the dynamics and consequences of what's come to be called post-truth politics, where conviction trumps fact and the norms of political communication have been radically disrupted. For the academics, the issue, I think, has been seismic in a different way, with apprehension of a paradigm shift, or at least some intense pressure being put on paradigms commonly used to study privileged objects, democracy, the nation state, the economy, America itself. What combines these concerns is a far-reaching delegitimization of knowledge and expertise, that's now widely assumed to evidence a crisis in and off liberal democracy. To say that the Trump election and the early presidency exceed existing means of explanation and representation is not to say it's unknowable or beyond interpretation, but rather to underline that it challenges the grounds and frames of interpretation to the degree that these have functioned based on assumptions about truth and democracy. We need to consider fresh ways of looking at America as an object of knowledge. Some here will be aware that this has long been a focal issue for American studies scholars, but the challenge to think afresh is certainly not the preserve of Americanists. None of us should be complacent about our paradigms or tools of knowledge. Even those of us who have critiqued the values and assumptions of liberal democracy are challenged to think anew when these are shifting before our eyes. We are, I think, at a complex, pivotal point of paradigm change, where the bedrock of liberal democracy has been mined, and conventions of critical inquiry, not to mention active dissent, are being compromised, if not rendered obsolete. For a great many Americans, America changed on the 9th of November 2016. That may sound an extreme claim, 
but recall the references to unreality and dislocation expressed by so many at that time. Something happened. Some commentators spoke of a form of collective trauma. Now, I think it's easy to belittle, perhaps some would even mock, such reactions. Some have mocked them. It's also worth pointing out that the sky did not fall in. Or did it? After all, the measurement that most media reports used to assure Americans that the sky had not fallen in was reports that markets had not only stayed stable, but risen. So this was a good result, and all was well with America. That the reason the markets rose was because corporations foresaw greater profits under Trump barely seemed to register in this collective delusion of what represents the national interest. If anything, the turn to markets to measure the public good represents the way in which neoliberalism recast democratic ideals in corporate terms. I think it's precisely this normative articulation of normality that's called into question by the Trump election. Again and again, commentators have looked for some kind of return to normality. The idea that as president-elect, Donald Trump would suddenly learn or at least mimic civility. The idea that the office of the presidency would curb and reshape his wayward temperament, that the role would subsume the man, as we're often told it does. But as Mark Danner observed recently, quote, the early weeks of the Trump presidency have been an ongoing seminar on where norms end and laws begin, of how much of what we relied on when it came to the president's conduct rested largely on a heretofore unquestioned foundation of centuries-old custom, unquote. This desire for normality reflects a concern that the election of Trump is something more, something different from the normal run of Republican and Democrat presidencies. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek argues that it, quote, represents a radical restructuring of the entire political space. For the journalist Edward Luce, who will speak here this evening, it pretends, quote, the retreat of Western liberalism, the title of his new book, which was published yesterday, while Trump's advisor Steve Bannon believes that it cements, quote, the beginning of a new political order that will entail, quote, the destruction of the administrative state. These claims at least affect to name and understand the change at hand. But what if, what if something happened that we truly don't understand? Now this may sound like an empty exercise in sophistical thinking, but that's not my intent. Rather, I just want to press for a few minutes the possibility of thinking or imagining otherwise and questioning the grounds of inquiry, of making sense of Trump's America. And more especially, I want to suggest that underlying the apprehension with which Trump's election, um, sorry, underlying the apprehension that with Trump's election, nothing will be as it used to be, resides a deeper fear that nothing had ever been the way it used to be. So what I'm referring to here is a distinctively American, more particularly liberal democratic myopia about what constitutes normative political and social reality. A myopia that registers a profound naturalization of American reality, fed by delusions of continuity, such that liberal democracy functions as an ontological bubble. A bubble that liberals apprehend as fixed, a fixed horizon, that is to say, they find it hard to think or imagine outside its doxa, to consider that alternative realities are possible, and to understand that the edifice of reality is precarious. Now, when I say that something happened, I mean this. There has been a shift in American reality. Such shifts are always at work, but sometimes they're seismic. Sometimes something happens. So let me take you back briefly to, I think, another historical moment of when something happened. Reflecting on the 1960 televised debates between the presidential candidates, Richard Nixon and John Kennedy, the novelist Philip Roth lamented, the American writer in the middle of the 20th century has his hands full in trying to understand, then describe, and then make credible much of the American reality. The actuality is outdoing our talents, and the culture tosses up figures almost daily that are the envy of any novelist. On the TV screen, as a real public image and as a political fact, my mind balked at taking Nixon in." End quote. Now, this sense that reality was outrunning the capacity of writers to represent it, it's not new, but tellingly articulated by Roth as a challenge 
occasioned by the growth of televisual media and the transformation of politics into spectacle. His comments indicated something shattering, an epochal shift in what he termed the American reality. Now, it's not coincidental that Roth was writing at the start of a period of intense social and political unrest in the United States. And as he pilloried many contemporary American writers for failing to respond to the change, he noted one exception. He said, there is Norman Mailer, and he's an interesting example of someone who in our era has provoked magnificent disgust um, about the president. Sure enough, Mailer did help fashion a new journalism in the 1960s that could cope with this emerging society of the spectacle. And in his now infamous 1960 essay on Kennedy's election campaign, titled Superman Comes to the Supermarket, he described the president to be as, quote, an existential hero who could tap into the drives that roil the national unconscious. This reflected Miller's very particular vision of American history. He says, our history moves on two rivers, one visible, the other underground. There's the history of politics, which is concrete, factual, practical, and dull, and there's a subterranean river of untapped, ferocious, lonely, and romantic desires, the concentration of ecstasy and violence, which is the dream life of the nation, end quote. In Kennedy, he saw someone who would fuse these currents and potentially renew the nation. To be sure, he recognized the dangers in celebrating a Superman as leader. And, but he reckoned that Kennedy struck the right balance between rational substance and romantic style. Fast forward to today, and American reality seems to be undergoing another seismic shift, and again in sync with the cycle of civil unrest. And once again, reality appears to be outrunning American writers as they struggle to explain it and make it credible. Step forward, another ubermensch. Is Trump an existential hero in the mode that Miller described? Well, I think there can be little doubt that Trump has channeled the discontents of the nation. He's tapped into angers and resentments that are more than political. He dares to say what should not be said, shocking the political and cultural elites, speaking to and for the real Americans in their language giving voice to their anger, their thwarted dreams. Trump's call to make America great again is in some part an articulation and legitimization of what has been disavowed in the making of a liberal democracy. He promises national renewal, but the progressive, not the progressive forward-looking renewal promised by Kennedy. Instead, he offers a regressive, backward-looking nationalism. For Miller, Kennedy's heroism was inherent in his ability to balance glamorous style with political substance. Trump displays no such ability. He displays an excess of style and a deficit of substance. His heroism, such as it is, marks a new stage in the aestheticization of politics in which entertainment and political life have converged as never before. Trump is the Superman unleashed as celebrity phantasm a figure of libidinal enjoyment who embodies the obscene underside of liberal democracy. As was his campaign, so his presidency has been shadowed by neo-fascist subtext and authoritarian tendencies. And I just want to end with a few observations on that last. Trump's gift for seizing attention and peddling fantasy plugs him into the zeitgeist. I don't think there's much doubt about that. And it bemuses those who believe that lies should have consequences. For many liberal educated Americans, his political ascension is a confusing assault on their sense of reality. His victory should remind us just how fragile the social and political order we take for granted is, and how quickly an advanced democracy can be dragged into, or at least toward, barbarism. Is it not a little shocking that Americans should need to be reminded of that? Perhaps, but then again, perhaps not. Perhaps the amnesia is a component of the American worldview. Might it be that this aspect of Trump's election is better or at least more readily understood in other countries where there's a living memory of the pains of populist authoritarianism, where people are more familiar with how reality can be dismantled? Europeans have their own sharp memories, of course. I note that Hannah Arendt's books have been selling very well over the last few months. Might this be because she constantly reminded her reader of how the powerlessness created by capitalist exploitation can explode into far-right totalitarianism. The Spanish journalist Andres Miguel Rondon, in a piece published by Politico last month, took issue with American naivety about alternative realities 
He observes pithily, quote, the developed world seems to be discovering this concept of the post-factual universe for the first time, end quote. And in the article, he describes his own experiences of growing up in Venezuela, surrounded by the fictional universe of Hugo Chavez's making. Rondon distills the populist appeal of an alternative reality. I quote, Populism is not a system of facts or solutions, operating in the complex world of policy and legislation, but rather it's an alternative, sorry, it's an interactive fiction, born of posturing and symbolism, where whole countries can become not what they are, but what they believe themselves to be, end quote. Trump's populist appeal in the United States posits just such an interactive fiction, a dramaturgy of Trump's making and orchestration of continual disruption and outrage. Rondon's comments should remind us that Trump's election is not the first sign of post-factualism in the United States. The key shift is that the deceptions are now widely mandated. If we were looking for an earlier example of post-factual delusion, we might, for example, look to the O.J. Simpson trial in 1995. Uncannily, two TV shows based on the trial ran during the 2016 election campaign. Spotting the parallels, Matt Tabay of the Rolling Stone described the Simpson trial as, quote, America's first great post-factual tragedy, the same story of myopic intellectuals clinging to facts and rules while scoundrels steamrolled their way to victory, writing narrative and celebrity. End quote. The key shift between the 1990s and today is that the deceptions are now widely accepted. The frightening story is not that Donald Trump lies, but that he's mandated to do so. Trump's very performance of lies and fabrications is what designates his reality for his supporters. So, how are we to make sense of the new American reality of Trump's America? Well, that's for us all to discuss over the next couple of days. I can only conclude by quoting once again from those old hippies, Buffalo Springfield, there's battle lines being drawn, nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Thank you. <laughs>